Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Janeri and this is Great Big History Podcast. And today we do our History 101 version of Buddhism. So this is Indian Culture Part 2. So Buddhism starts with a philosopher prince, Siddhartha Gudam. Even though it's spelled Gudama, it's I've had Indian students tell me it's Gudam. So Siddhartha, S I. D D H A R T H A Gudam G A U T A M A. And he's alive around 500 BC. He's alive at the same time Confucius is alive and about a hundred years before Socrates. And so he's a prince and his life is good. And if you want a question about how good his life is, watch the first 10 minutes of Eddie Murphy's Coming to America. He's got a good life. Everybody he knows is rich because he only hangs out with other princes. And what happens is, and there's a bunch of different stories about how this happens. I like the, he sneaks out on a Friday night because he was a teenager and his parents went to bed early and he's like, well, and you know, they were like, Hey, uh, Siddhartha, we know you're a teenager now. So, uh, if you want to stay up a little later to like nine 30, it's okay. But then go to bed, and we'll see you in the morning. And he snuck out. He went down the town looking for a party, looking to get jiggy with it. Down at the club, and what he discovered was poverty, illness, destitution for the first time. And he had a question, and that question is, why do I have so much when I've done so little? Because all I have is from my dad. My dad is a prince, so I'm a prince. I haven't done anything. I haven't earned being a prince. So why do I have so much? And these people work so hard and have so little. And so what he does next is incredibly important because what he does is he walks the earth. Now, he's rich enough to do other things. He's rich enough to call up the, the smartest guys in every university in India and bring them to him and sit there and go, okay, I've got a question for you answer riddle me this smart guys and to bring knowledge to him but he doesn't he walks the earth searching for knowledge so what does that mean it means one anybody can become enlightened anyone can find knowledge anywhere which is two where is knowledge it's in nature it's all around us you can find it anywhere it's everywhere So what does he come up with? He comes up with the four truths. The first is that pain and suffering are inescapable. And you may say, uh, duh, Siddhartha, but think about how much money we spend on drugs, on alcohol, on entertainment, on video games, just so we don't feel bad for a moment. How much do you spend yourself? How much do we spend as a society? just so we're not bored. I can't get you through a 45 minute lecture without you kind of like, oh, I gotta take out my phone and text somebody. And my class is hardly a bad class. It's actually a very good class. I like it a lot, but you don't wanna be bored for all of five seconds, so you have to do something else. So you spend $1,000 on a machine plus what, 40, 50, 60 bucks a month in order just not to be bored for 10 seconds. So when you think about how we try to avoid pain and suffering, Siddhartha, Buddha's number one is, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. It is, you are going to suffer. Pain is going to happen in your life. It is going to suck. So the next question is, why? What causes pain and suffering? Why can't I avoid it? And the answer is, because it's caused by your attachment and your desires. Why does it hurt to be broken up with rather than break up? Breaking up, you're like, woohoo, I'm free. Delete out of my contacts. 
block them from your Instagram, you're done. And you're like, woohoo, I'm liberated. But to be broken up with sucks. It always sucks. It will always suck to have someone walk up to you and say, I don't want you in my life anymore. Hurts. Why? Because even if it's a crappy relationship, you're still attached to something in that relationship. It's now, well, what am I going to do on Friday nights? Or I like this person or, or a whole host of things. Um, who am I going to go out with my buddies and their girlfriends with? Now I'm now I'm the lonely person, right? So it's your attachment and desire that causes pain and suffering. You little kids do this all the time. Watch. If you have little kids, you've seen this. If you don't, watch. Watch a little kid play with a toy. And another kid, little kid, brother, walks in, sees the kid playing with the toy, has a toy of his own, drops the toy, takes the other kid's toy. Why? Because it's not the toy. He had a toy. It wasn't the fun. It was the representation. It was that if my brother is having fun with that toy, that toy must be pleasurable and I want that pleasure. So pain and suffering is caused by your attachment and your desire to things. And you can't eliminate that. But you can, knowing this, minimize it. One day your mom is going to die. If you're lucky, you will bury your mother. Why do I say if you're lucky? Because if you're unlucky, you died first and she has to bury you, which is not the way it's supposed to work. So your mom is going to die and that's going to suck. There's no way for that not to suck. Even if you don't like your mom, even if you have a bad relationship with your mom, it's still going to suck. Why? Because you're attached. You're attached to memories, nostalgia. You're attached to the relationship if it's a good one. You're attached to the idea. If it's a bad relationship, why couldn't you be a better mom? Why couldn't you like me like other moms do? Why couldn't you be happy and celebrate me? Why? Well, now your mom is dead, and this works for dads too. And they can never be the dad that they're supposed to be. They can never take you fishing like they were supposed to do. They can never have those dad moments in the montages in movies. Why? Because they're dead and their chance is gone. Thanks. And so you might not be attached to the person. You may think your dad or your mom sucks, but you're attached to the idea of a dad or a mom. And why couldn't this person fulfill that idea? Now, if you have a good relationship, you could minimize this. You could say, hey, my mom lived to be 90, and you can't ask more than that. If you're a Christian or a Muslim, you say, they're in heaven. They're in a better place. So we have what we call coping mechanisms, a way of dealing with this pain. So knowing that my pain is caused by um attachment you can minimize this if anyone has ever if you've ever been broken up with and somebody's and you're like oh this sucks and someone says well if it's better to have love and lost than to have never loved or uh you have to set what you love free otherwise it was never yours th those kind of things they're platitudes and they're shakespeare but they're also coping mechanisms it's a way of saying yeah it was better to have loved and lost than to have never have loved this person or this thing. And finally, there's the eightfold path, the triumph of the eightfold path, which I know sounds like, wait a minute, the four truths and the fourth truth is eight more things. But it's not really. It's a list of eight things, but it's really one thing. And that one thing, the eightfold path, is rightness. And this is kind of the most profound one because it's you listen to yourself. There's the right meditation. The right understanding, the right motivation, the right speech, the right action. The idea is you know what's right for you. You know what path you're supposed to be on. If you've ever dated somebody way longer than you were supposed to, and you, you knew it, you knew it was a bad relationship, you knew the relationship was going on longer than it should have, you knew you should have broken up before, and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on out of inertia, out of this attachment, out of this, well... I don't want to hurt the person or I don't want to be hurt or it, then it gets darker from there. But the idea is, you know it. And so what Buddha says is you can find your own happiness. Now, happiness is not 
happiness. Happiness is not a value in itself. Happiness is the minimization of pain and suffering. Happiness is less pain and suffering. But the idea of it is, is that you can find it yourself. And that means everybody is on their own path. So what was good for one person is not necessarily good for the other person. And you come together and you separate and you do, do, do your own thing. But if you listen to yourself, and that's incredibly powerful, because what Buddha is saying is, you know yourself, know thyself, to thy own self be true. The Greeks and Shakespeare, over and over again. The idea is, you know how to act. You know what's right for you. If you just do that. So what causes pain and suffering is not doing that. Not being in the job that you want, but the job that makes money. You know, I'm sure you have friends who hate their jobs, who complain about their girlfriends, who complain about what they're doing with their lives. And you're like, just change. And that's what Buddha would say. Just change. And they go, well, but I make good money at my job. It's like, yes, but you hate your job. You could make less money and be happier somewhere else. And that's what Buddha is trying to sell is happiness, is the lack of misery. It makes no sense to make your life miserable in order to make money. Money doesn't matter. Happiness matters. Self-fulfillment matters. And you may say, well, Buddha was rich. Well, he gave all that away. Now, he didn't live quite the complete destitute aesthetic life, but he gave most of his money away. He lived as a monk. So he's, he's saying, look, you need some money. You need some pleasures. There's actually a thing where a bunch of hardcore young monks are like, Buddha, you're not, you're not living up to what your own teaching. He's like, stop, just stop. As, as Aristotle will say, uh, 150 years later, um, moderation in all things. If you, if you do too much, then you're, why are you doing so much? Why are you living in a hole in the earth? What you're attached to is your proof that you are harder core than other believers, that you're the real one and no one else, everyone else is fake. So you're attached to that and it's causing you pain and suffering because you could sleep in a bed. So it's moderation in all things, but it's a trust in people the way Aristotle is. It's a trust and belief that you can find your own way. You can find your own path of happiness and don't be led astray by those attachments, whether to other people, whether to things, whether the money, like that cause misery. If you hate your job, quit your job, find one. There's got to be a job out there that will pay you money that you can live on that you will be happy with and satisfied with. That's the Eightfold Path. If you can't stand the person you're in a relationship with, stop being with them because it's making you miserable and you're making the other person miserable and it would be better for both of you if you found people who made you happy, who you could be with easier. So that's Buddhism. Or that's a very simple Buddhism, but that's the basic four truths and the eightfold path. And you could see just how much it's about. It's not about finding something. It's about minimizing, about limiting pain and suffering and finding your own path in life. And that you know that path. So it's very pro-person. And so we're going to finish up here. In our next lecture, we're going to finish up India by doing politics. So have a good day. Bye.